Um, hi everyone, thank you for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Alex Nickel, I'm a junior at the New Wave School, and I'm going to be talking about the power of science communication on YouTube. But first, let's start with a little bit of an experiment. So we all know what toilets are, I use toilets every day, you use toilets every day, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you think you know like the general gist of how a toilet works. Just, you know, the general, general gist. Okay, okay, I like it. Let's see. You raised your hand, we're going to do a little bit of audience participation right here. You raised your hand, can you explain to me maybe how a toilet works? Um, you flush, everything goes down. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. That seems to be uh, many people's answer to that question. I actually uh, interviewed a lot of people at my school this question a, a while back, and they said it answers very similar to that. Here's a clip. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being you have no knowledge whatsoever, and 10 being you are like an absolute expert in this, how well do you think you know how a twin works? 3. A 3? That's a good answer. It's all, yeah, it's all answer. Wait, it's not a 9. I give it four and a half out of ten. So can you explain to me step by step how a toilet works? Well, so there's a handle, and you flush it, and it goes through some machinery. But it's known as just kind of pipes and like, I don't know, how much. So the water washes down into the pipes, right? There's like pipes going after the top thing, and then you press the flusher thing, and then the water goes all around, and it flushes the your stuff. It goes all, how does that actually like flush it out? Like that's... Because I'm a pipe. <laughs> so now, after explaining that, can you reevaluate yourself on a scale of one to ten? How well do you think you know? Two. Six or seven. Like two or three. Like two. Like two is maybe pretty accurate, although I might want to decrease to a one. I <laughs> myself on a one and a half. No, I'm still a three. Uh, like seven. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Seven. Okay, right. Don't want to say two to three. Oh, like one. One. <laughs> <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is this concept called the illusion of explanatory depth, where the concept that we think we know more about everyday things than we actually do. And it doesn't just apply to toilets, it applies to things like refrigerators, or bikes, or zippers. Now, I find this wildly fascinating, right? I'm 17 years old. That means I've used toilets so much that they've become boring at this point. And yet, I still don't really know how they actually work. Moreover, I think it's also an idea other people could benefit from knowing, right? It's not like the end of the world if I don't know how a toilet works, but this also applies to other aspects of our life as well. I have political opinions, you probably have political opinions, I hear the hot new rave these days. Um, but the next time you go to vote, or before you go to vote, try to explain some of the policies you're actually voting for. Make sure you actually do know how they work, as opposed to just thinking you know how they work, because of the illusion of explanatory depth. So this idea I find so interesting, I decided to make a video on it. And I make uh, videos on ideas like this all the time at my YouTube channel, Technicality. Get ready for the elevator pitch. Technicality takes a closer look at our awesome universe. I make videos <laughs> about science, humanities, and everything I find fascinating about our world. I made over 70 episodes on everything from physics to history to psychology. Uh, these videos have had a total of millions of views. I've been recognized by the Huffington Post and Mashable and uh, network television. And just recently, actually last week, I hit 50,000 subscribers, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> That's, that's been my reaction all week. Um, <laughs> so, educational YouTube has been pretty much my life for the past five, six, seven years. So, I thought I'd share a window into my life with you guys today. And to do so, I want to answer three main questions. First, how, why is YouTube so revolutionary for science communication? Secondly, how can YouTube be used in the classroom? And third, how does this platform influence not just me, but so many other people to be better learners? Part of the first. Why is YouTube so revolutionary for science communication? And in order to understand this, we sort of have to understand a brief history of science communication. Now, obviously, there's no one point in time where science communication was just invented. It's not like someone woke up someday and was like, you know what, I'm going to invent talking about science in a layman manner today. Um, but rather, it's more of a process, right? Following the uh, science, scientific revolution of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, we start to see in the 19th century the rise of not just public science, or, you know, publicly funded science by governments or uh, universities, but also the public caring about science. And with the rise of the public caring about science, science communication was born. In the 1950s, quicker than you can say, I missed the original Twilight Zone. Televisions were invading. 
color agents were invading the American household. This actually works out great because I'm learning about this in my US history class right now. Um, but televisions were invading the American household, and they gave uh, science communication a new medium to play with, the medium of video. And because of that, a lot of great science shows were produced, whether that be for kids or for adults. This is the context in which YouTube arose, right? Well, like I said, a ton of great stuff was produced by television for science content, right? There's also a lot of limitations and drawbacks to television as a medium. Namely, it's really expensive to make a TV show, right? It takes a lot of manpower and time and energy to produce an episode. And because of that, getting your own TV show is a pretty hard thing and not something just anyone can get. Television executives already look at science content as kind of risky because they don't really appeal to everyone, right? So add on to that the expensiveness factor, and it's not like a bunch of science TV is being produced every day. YouTube changes that with a concept I like to call the democratization of science communication, because that's long and sounds cool. Um, the democratization of science communication is this concept that anyone anywhere can make a video about an idea they're passionate about, and if they do it well enough, it can become popular. To kind of see this in action, let, let's look at a case study. So this is the channel called Vsauce. This is an educational YouTube channel created by Michael Stevens. He created this about nine years ago, back in 2010. Uh, and since then, he's made hundreds of episodes on all sorts of science topics and amassed over 1. Billion, billion views, 1.5 billion views, or viewed 1.5 billion times, which is a lot. Um, and as successful as Michael is now, as amazing as he is at science communication, and as much as I love him for that, 10 years ago, he would have never gotten his own TV show, right? He would, he would have been seen as way too much of a risky investment for television producers or for anyone to, to take that on hand and give him his own show. However, because of the democratization of science communication, combined with his natural talent at science communication, he can make a YouTube channel and thrive on this platform. And this isn't the only person where this kind of general framework applies to. We see uh, many people uh, thriving on YouTube as science communicators, and as such, we've kind of entered this new era of science communication, if you will. Right? YouTube itself is doing really well as a medium. Uh, it gets 1.9 billion million users, which is a lot, uh, and 300 hours of content are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Uh, but education and learning content on YouTube itself is doing really well. Uh, education content on YouTube gets about a billion views a day. That's out of about 5 billion views total. So on top of the democratization of science communication, YouTube has also affected how science is communicated. Namely, on television, uh, we start to see like 22 to 45 minute episodes. Well, on YouTube, a general educational video is between 5 and 15 minutes. Obviously, there's no hard time, but they tend to fall around that much. And time isn't the only thing affected. The style of how science is communicated is affected as well. On television, there's a lot more of a focus on a narrative, right? There's like interviews, and you might go to different locations, and there's intricate animation. Well, on YouTube, there's a lot more of a focus on brevity. It's usually a person talking to a camera or into a microphone with visuals on the screen. People like what I'm doing right now, huh? Man. So, in sum, why is YouTube so revolutionary for science communication? Not just because of this democratization of science communication, but also this new sort of style that science is communicated through video. Part of the second, how can we use YouTube in the classroom? So when I was in sixth grade, I spent all of my lunches uh, Thank you. <laughs> I heard a mix of laughs and awes, so cool. Um, in sixth grade, I spent all of my lunches in uh, the science classroom watching science YouTubers. I know, right? My social life was popping. Um, and, you know, two to three years later, in sixth grade, after I've been watching them for a couple of years, I thought to myself, you know what? I can do this. I can make a video of democratization of science communication, right? This shouldn't be that hard. It was very hard, and the video was very bad. Uh, the video I made. Uh, it was called Games, and I threw it together in a weekend. Uh, and in retrospect, it was pretty terrible, like I said. Um, it's basically a ripoff of a Vsauce and an ASAP Science video combined. Uh, and, I mean, there's no sound on this video right now, but if you were to hear the sound, you would see that it's hilariously out of sync with what I'm writing. I didn't know how to edit at the time, so what's going on here is not all what I'm saying. Um, however, nonetheless, I uh, brought the video into my science class the next day. My science teacher at the time, her name was Chris Flores. She watched it. She was like, Alex, this is amazing. You've got to continue to pursue this. You've got to work on this more. I was like, oh, that's very nice. So I did. And for science that year, uh, in sixth grade, we had to pick one topic uh, to kind of research for the entire year. And I decided to research blended learning and how YouTube videos can be used in the classroom. 
This, by the way, is my original uh, journal from that year. Um, has my problem, my mission, all that fun jazz. Um, and fun fact, these pictures were actually taken about a week ago. Uh, Krista Flores doesn't live here anymore. She now lives in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, but uh, she tweeted these out the other day, kind of unprompted. It was just like, hey, uh, this is Alex's old stuff. I'm using this in my curriculum next semester. I was like, whoa, what a great teacher. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the year, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> at the end of the year, uh, I made a culminating video called Road vs. Blended, The Battle of Learning. And I kind of assessed the various pros and cons to road memorization learning and uh, blended learning where you use YouTube videos in the classroom. By the way, the most embarrassing part of my YouTube channel at the time was not the Angry Birds shirt. Um, <laughs> if you're very curious, the most embarrassing part of my YouTube channel was in my fourth episode called 15 Facts About Taxes. And this was the first fact. Number one, tax code contains over 4 million words, which is like a lot of words. To put that in perspective, that is 10 times the amount of words that's in the Bible. And then I just mentioned the Bible, so we all know what it kind of is. I'm glad you enjoyed that, because that was very painful. Not choice for Woodside Prairie. Um, uh, I actually don't know how to play the guitar. You better fall asleep. Cool. I didn't know how to play the guitar. I don't even know how I got a guitar, to be honest. I just kind of showed up there. Anyways, let's fast forward five years later. Um, now, I, I pretty regularly get comments like this, uh, where like in my video on Alexander Hamilton, it's like, watch this in history class today. Or uh, someone tweeted at me, hey, I'm in university, and uh, watched your cocktail party effect video in psych lecture. And it's pretty crazy how I've kind of transitioned from being someone who kind of studies how to use, use YouTube videos in the classroom, to being someone whose YouTube videos is actually used in the classroom, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, and I think this is actually a perfect way you can use YouTube videos in the classroom, right? I don't think YouTube is going to revolutionize education. Uh, there's actually a great Veritasium video on this, where basically the thesis is, this will revolutionize education, is one of like, the most overused sayings. He says, oh, remember when experts predicted, oh, this would revolutionize education, or this, or this, and, you know, we're all still here. Um, floppy disks didn't radically change how I learn. Um, however, while YouTube won't revolutionize education, and while it won't radically change the way we instill knowledge on the next generation, YouTube is an incredibly beneficial tool that teachers do have at, on their tool belt in order to inspire kids to learn and convey knowledge to their students. Part the third. How has YouTube influenced not just me, but so many other people to be better learners? So I went on a school trip to Alaska the other week, and uh, we were just hiking around, as you do in Alaska, and my friend Billy comes up to me. I'm still happy that people are naming their kids Billy, but my friend Billy comes up to me, and he says, Alex, what's technicality's purpose? And I'm like, what? It's kind of nervous. Like, what's technicality's purpose? And I started just being like, oh, you know, I, I make videos on stuff I would like making video about, right? He's like, no, 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 what's technicality's purpose? So I started giving him the whole elevator pitch that I gave you, where I'm like, technicality takes a close look at our awesome universe. And he's like, no, 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 that's technicality's mission. What's technicality's purpose? And I was like, there's a difference? I didn't know that. Uh, Billy's the head of our robotics team, so he deals with missions and purposes and pitches all the time. But he's like, Alex, what is technicality's purpose? Why do you do what you do? Um, and I didn't have a good answer for him at the time. But since then, I've been thinking about it uh, quite a lot. And I've been thinking about the impact both Michael Stevens and all the other educational YouTubers that I watched as a kid and still watch now have had on my life. Also, you know, I'm a junior in high school. It's May. We're gearing up for finals time. Clay knows what I'm talking about. He's also a junior at my school. They tell us that junior year is the roughest time uh, for academics. So because of that, you know, I've kind of been reflecting on the way these people have impacted the way I view academics and the way I view education. And that kind of got me to technicality's purpose, right? Michael and all these other people have made me love learning in a way that I believe is unprecedented, right? I have a passion for just soaking up knowledge around me, and I'm curious to just learn whatever I can, and it's because of these phenomenal people. 
So that's my purpose for technicality, to try to make other people love learning as much as these people have made me. And I think that's also a good answer to that original question, right? YouTube influences people to be better learners by feeding their curiosity to learn, by having this sort of almost endless uh, pit of videos that they can explore and they can be passionate about. You know, I end every technicality episode with a saying, thanks for watching DFTDA, which is an internet thing that stands for Don't Forget to Be Awesome, and Explore On, to remind people that, you know, Learning doesn't stop at the end of this video, but rather, you know, they can always search more and they can always explore this amazing world around us. So that being said, thanks for watching, DFTBA, and Explore On. Thank you.